My name is Gail Patton and we are at court one of the Ashland Tennis and Fitness Club in Ashland, Oregon and I am one of the tennis pros here. And so um, my sports journey, you know, actually started in Sacramento, California in, uh, in the 1950s and I started playing tennis in 1958. At the time it was really the only sport that was available for girls because I took lessons at the swim and tennis club where uh, my family belonged. And um, just a little history of, of girls and sports at the time that I was growing up. I always knew I was an athlete. I was probably better than most of the kids, boys and girls in my class, whatever sport we were playing. But I was never called an athlete. I was called a tomboy all the way up through high school. And uh, so I, I always, you know, wondered why that was. My brother was able to play Little League Baseball and I wanted to play and I was told, well, I can't play because I'm a girl. And that's sort of the way it was. And no one around me, you know, in the adult world said, wait a minute, that isn't right. And so most of us just thought, well, I don't like it. It's not fair, but I guess that's the way it is. It was like there was no adult in my life to say, you know what, that's wrong, I'm gonna fight for you about it. I think it was just sort of, well, that's the way it is. And I said, well, I'm as good as those boys are that are playing baseball, and I play baseball all the time. You know, we play in the street, we play after school, we play in the park, so why can't I play with them? It's like, well, because you're a girl. And, you know, but when you're, 10 years old or whatever and somebody you know an adult says well you can't do it you know and we were taught to okay if an adult says something that's what it is and and so um you know i i've learned to be more outspoken and and say hey you know um i think i think there's a better way to do something so in junior high i i actually went to a school district where they did have uh, sports for girls. Um, they were either before school or after school. Um, we weren't allowed to have a league like the boys did. They called them sports days. So we'd practice for all these weeks and then we'd go to a sports day and all the other, you know, girls teams from volleyball or basketball or whatever from the district would come. And the same thing in high school. Um, we had, you know, we, we had teams but um, it was PE teachers who um, coached the girls' team, and I found out later they were not even paid. They did it out of the goodness of their heart. The boys' teams, the coaches got paid. The, the, the girls' teams, the coaches didn't get paid. Um, I went to, to college at uh, UC Davis, and uh, um, there was a good women's program there and the NCAA at the time didn't want to have anything to do with women's sports so there was a national women's organization the AIAW and it was all women who promoted, promoted um, women's athletics at the college level across the country and so we did have a league and we did have conferences and um, we played a lot of the Pac-12 conference now, um, Stanford and Cal and um, other schools, um, you know, in Oregon, or mainly in California and Nevada and such. Um, but even at that time, we went to, I think it was the first invitational na national basketball t tournament that was offered for women in 1970 in uh, Coloe, North Carolina, um, the UC Davis team, our basketball team, was invited and we didn't even have warm-ups. And the day before we left, um, an anonymous donor got us warm-ups. And it turned out, I found out later, it was a father of one of the players. And up until that point, they had given us um, it, they were the hand-me-downs from the men's wrestling team. That's what we had been wearing as warm-ups. And so, you know, even at the college level, and this was in the late 60s and early 70s, 
um, there was a real discrepancy. Uh, we had a, a softball team. The men had a baseball team, a huge field, um, nice locker room and stuff. Our, our women's softball games were played in a tiny field without a fencing around it. And so if the ball hit the bike path um, on a bounce, it was a ground rule double. If it w was hit completely into the street, it was a home run. And yeah, you know, that, that type of thing happened. Um, my last year of playing uh, college softball, varsity softball, we were undefeated and we um, had earned the right to go uh, on to the, you know, I don't know if it was a district tournament or a sectional tournament. And the athletic director said, no, it wasn't in the budget. And our men's team came in third in their conference and we were first and undefeated. We were not allowed to advance. They were allowed to advance. And I remember some of our, our players, we were really, really upset and we were gonna go to the administration. And our coach fought for us, and, but she said, do not, do not go to the administration. And I think it's one of the few things in my life that I didn't do and I wish I had. We were so afraid that she was gonna get fired because she had gone out and limb for us and we didn't want to make things worse. Well, turns out she got fired anyway. And we didn't go support her and we didn't go fight for our own rights. And I, I still, and that was in 1972. And that's still one of the things I really regret in life that, that we didn't, didn't fight. So when I got out of college, I started um, coaching and teaching um, in a school district in Sacramento and I was a girls athletic director and I really fought hard um, there was a, a big gym and a, a small gym at the school and the big gym said boys gym and the little gym said girls gym took me two years and fights with administration administration and, and boys coaches they took those off and now there it's the large gym and the small gym and uh, they were making all the women varsity teams play in the small gym where all the boys teams varsity and JV got to play in the large gym and so we ended up being able to play all the women's varsity matches in the large gym and then um, within a year volleyball was in the large gym so was basketball, you know, the varsity and the JV. They just played them on different days. And so, but it was, it was a long, you know, it was a constant fight. Um, you know, with, with administration who weren't used to um, really supporting the girls' athletics. And from there, um, I ended up going up to the University of Oregon to do um, a, ma a second master's up there in sports science. And um, I was teaching tennis there, and I was also teaching basketball. And one of the classes I had was mostly men in it. And that was really the first time it's like, okay, you know, I'm being treated like, a, you know, I'm, I'm a coach, I'm a teacher, I'm not a girl's teacher. You know, so that was really nice. And so once I got up to U of O, I thought, I'm not sure I want to go back and work at the junior high or the high school. And so I, I started at the college level and uh, worked in Wyoming, worked at a small college, Rocky Mountain College in Montana. And then in 1985, ended up at Southern Oregon University. When I, when I went to Rocky Mountain College, it was a very small college, but that was the first time um, in athletics that I was at a school where it was purely Title IX. I had the exact same budget as the men, um, and I was coaching women's college basketball at the time. Exact same um, 
opportunities, same budget, same recruiting budget, um, same recruiting, um, same scholarship budget, and it was absolutely, you know, wonderful. And I realized this is the way it should be. And unfortunately, coming to Oregon after that, it wasn't, it wasn't quite the same. Um, we didn't have the same budget, even though we were in the same conference. We didn't have the same scholarships. Um, you know, and one of the things they said was that, well, the men's team brings in money and the women's does, you know, doesn't, but at the same time, they weren't promoted the same at the time. Things have changed an awful lot. And, and I'm glad to see that, you know, some years it's the men's program that's excelling, you know, and some years it's the women's program that's excelling and, and they both are getting support. And I, I really, really like that, so. Um, and Bev was still here when I came in 1985. And so, you know, and, and Sally was interest, instrumental in introducing me to people who were instrumental in women's athletics in Oregon, including up at the Uni University of Oregon. We, um, Sally got her doctorate there, and we had some of the same professors and some, you know, um, at, the, at the U of O, and one of whom played in the Women's National Baseball League during World War, you know, two, and um, yeah, and you know, so we had some real incredible role models there. And, uh, you know, and, and definitely, and, and people here, like, like you said, Bev, you know, Bev Bennett and, and uh, Ruth Beber and some of, some of those other people. So I actually got to be here. I took Ruth Beber's place um, you, when she retired. But, um, but, you know, we, we had a really, um, the women's faculty, we, you know, we would go out and have meals and we would celebrate holidays and exchange Christmas presents and things like that. So um, it, it was definitely a sorority. And I found that wherever I was in athletics, it was, you know, um, we really supported each other and had each other's backs. And so that was really helpful. You know, and I found out when I, when I left college and um, started coaching at the high school level, I was thinking, geez, you know what? I am, I'm teaching kids things that I never learned until college because I really never had any instruction. It was like, okay, we're gonna play volleyball and we're just gonna do this. But, but everything I did except for tennis was self-taught until I got into college. And, um, you know, so I, I really started in the, in the early 70s um, in the school district where I was working in, in Sacramento. We just saw the girls' sports program blossom. And, uh, you know, to be a part of that. And I've always, whether it's um, coaching at the college level, the high school level. Matter of fact, last year I went back and coached the high school at Ashland. I'm going to do it again uh, this year. And... I, I'm always sure to, to tell them about the history. They, they don't even understand that I didn't have a chance to do what they're doing. They just figure it's always been there. And so it's really important for them to understand the history and to recognize, like other things, it wasn't always an opportunity that they had. So to appreciate it, take advantage of it, and. Uh, you know, and, and to make sure that they continue the support, you know, when they get in a position to do. Came to SOU, I just um, was really, um, really happy about the female professors we had in the, the health and physical education and athletic department at the time. As I said, we, we supported each other and it, it wasn't an easy time for the college at the time. They were making lots of changes. Matter of fact, they totally revamped the, you know, the um, physical education program at the school. And, and we used to supervise our own student teachers and stuff. And they, you know, they, they revamped everything and, 
and some people had to leave because their jobs were being dropped and stuff. But, you know, through that tough time, the women always, we always understood um, how important it uh, was for us to stick together and how important it was for us to fight for, you know, for equity for women because it was going to, you know, um, we, we knew actually we were sort of part of the history of, of the changing times from um, the old boys club <laughs> and that's what really athletics was I think when all of us got in it and uh, I remember when I was in coaching in high school our school district actually went on strike the um, I got paid as a coach to coach a girls team exact same schedule as the boys the boys coaches were paid three thousand dollars and the girls coaches were paid three hundred and when our school district went on strike and this was right when they were enacting title nine um, all of all of the female coaches or the coaches coaching female sports um, retroactively where I, I thought it was like my first year on a full-time job and I just thought I'd won the lottery <laughs> going for I'd coach three you know three sports that year and it went from getting you know nine hundred dollars to nine thousand and that was huge and that was part of title nine and yeah so yeah and title nine has had its ups and downs um, there's some unintended consequences and one of those was after a few years of being girls athletic director the the school district says well you know what we don't need a boys act athletic director and a girls athletic director anymore because we don't have boys and girls sports it's all sports so what happened was um in every single case the, the person who'd been there longest was the male so all the females lost their jobs as athletic directors and became one director and then another thing that happened unintended was the coaching, the coaches of boys sports going, why am I working with, you know, this boys basketball team, which is so much pressure and I can go coach the girls team now, no pressure on me at all and make the same amount of money. So if you, if you looked around, you started seeing that it used to be all the girls sports were coached by women. And now I would say, you know, more than half of some of those sports are coached by men. And so, um, you know, and, and uh, I know there's good women out there. And uh, I think the parity is, is starting to happen. And um, I think some of the things that are, are showing that we have women coaches now in the NBA. And uh, now at least one coach and an intern in the NFL that are that are women and women have started um, officiating um, men's basketball games and so it, it's coming around but it, it starts in the grassroots and works its way up to the higher levels what I can tell you is the people the men who supported us the the women's athletic movement the the females who are fighting for equity um, one I can count on one hand and those are the people I absolutely remember because they were not the majority I mean I still have a letter that one of the professors from SOU um, sent to me when I was fighting for women's athletics here and um, was really in a tight spot and he sent me a letter encouraging me he has since you know died but I kept that letter and I still have that letter that's how important it was to me and I I, I remember you know those people who um, didn't have to but said Gail you're doing the right thing or you know I'm behind you so yeah and the others it was just in I think it's like they they weren't mean or malevolent people they were just that's how everybody grew up it's like well boy sports rule and girls you know you should be you you should be cooking you know and that's the the type of thing so i mean it just it takes a 
it takes a while but uh, yeah I'm I'm happy the progress we've made we got a we got a whole lot more of it and you know it it goes from you know women's athletics gay rights whatever it is you know you see that next group of people who are, are marginalized or whatever um, you know one one sheds light, sheds light on the other and I just think it it all makes all of us a better you know a, a better family of people you know um, and can I be brave enough to do it knowing that I might lose my job and so I've had to make those decisions and thank goodness um, later in life I haven't had to make those decisions um, I was confident enough and comfortable enough and knew my worth that if I didn't have a job in a particular place I was I would I would be fine that I felt strong enough to um, to be vocal to fight and um, I remember my mom I, I would use my mom as a sounding board a lot you know my mom goes Gail don't do anything to get yourself fired I go mom that's the whole point it doesn't matter I I get to do this now because if I get fired I will be fine and I have to do it so that the people who if they got fired aren't going to be fine that you know that I'm paving the way and so yeah but it, it, it it's been it definitely has been a conscious fight I know that when I was working there from 1985 to 1990 um, there was a suit brought um, they were looking in to the the fact that SOU was not in compliance with Title IX and I know there were people from the NCAA and other programs who came and talked with us coaches and and things like that and so um, later on in gosh I think it was 1996 that SOU brought in three more women's sports because they weren't in compliance with Title IX they brought back women's tennis they brought back women's softball and they brought back or they brought women's soccer which I don't think had ever been um, a sport at SOU and Sally Jones coached the team for two years from 1996 till 98 and then she retired and then I coached the women's tennis team from 1998 till 2008 when I retired and um, two years after that they dropped the tennis program again at SOU and unfortunately that was more because so many of the schools that we played had dropped out of our conference and there were four schools in our entire region um, two in in um, Idaho College of Idaho and Lewis Clark State in Lewiston Idaho and then um, Calgary in um, Calgary Canada and it was University of Alberta and Southern Oregon and so we played an NAI schedule but it was mainly in California sometimes we have to go to Southern California or we go to a tournament in Arizona played all the the private schools in Oregon that used to be in our conference so as sad as I was that they they dropped tennis at least I understood that that was not a title nine issue so but the other two sports are flourishing you know and I think tennis would have we had done well and I think you know it would have continued and uh, you know always coaching at SOU you know we say you know one of our biggest setbacks um, is our location and you know it we love it where we are but as far as you know sometimes recruiting and sometimes getting schools to come or whatever it's you know it's an issue so um, yeah so I, I think SOU has made made uh, wonderful strides and I know the administration really supports um, the women and it wasn't always that way and I know um, you know at one point way back in the 80s I felt threatened when 
I actually went to the administration and said, well, you know, I don't think this is equitable for, um, you know, for, for the women that we're not giving, you know, even, even on meal money sometimes we weren't given the, the same amount of meal money on, on trips and things like that. And so um, it was, it, it made it, it made it hard. And it, uh, it was a little bit tough because sometimes decisions I made as a coach, it was because I was a little fearful of retribution and that's, that's not the way to coach. And, um, you know, when I came back in tennis, I didn't feel that at all. And I was a better coach because of it. And, and so I was really, I was really ha that I, I came back and coached because I had a much, um, much happier feeling about um, what, what I was um, providing for students and um, how I felt about how I was coaching. So, so that was good. I was really, really happy for my, my second chance. So, I mean, I love being at SOU. I love living here. And um, when I left SOU, I, I stayed in the Valley because I loved it so much and worked at tennis clubs. And I'm still doing it. I have um, been one of many um, directors for the Big Owls Tennis Tournament, and I directed it last three years, and last year was the 44th annual Big Owls Tournament, and uh, Big Owl Carver, who um, started the tournament way back when, or he sponsored it when it was part of the Recreation Department um, tournament, just uh, just died this this past um, fall and um, you know the tennis community is well represented at his celebration of life but um, luckily I've handed it over to our new director of tennis for this year. I, I'm sure I will be on the courts and helping and stuff but uh, uh, yeah you know having an indoor court uh, um, or an indoor tennis club in a town the size of Ashland is pretty unusual. And we've had a, a, a tennis club in Medford um, with six indoor courts and three outdoor courts just um, disappear a year and a half ago, you know, which is always sad. We don't want to see any tennis loss, but, um, you know, the support we have for tennis in this community is really pretty amazing. And then when we get people coming in, especially from Northern and Southern California, they say, well, we picked Ashland because it had an indoor, you know, club so we can play year round. So it is important in a lot of people's lives. And so, yeah, and um, I think with all sports, um, you know, I always try to, to give back. You know, so I tried to give back to girls and women in sports when I was dealing with that. And definitely, I think as tennis pros um, through the U.S. Uh, Professional Tennis Association, one of, you know, our ideals is to give back to the sport. And I think those of us who work here, I think we do a good job of giving back. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, working with the recreation department to give junior lessons or I've done uh, adult lessons in the summer at, at Hunter Park, you know, for many years is just to keep tennis growing and keep the opportunity for, for girls and women and everybody, you know. So I, I know as a, as a coach and as an athletic director, when I was the athletic director at the high school in, in Sacramento for a while, I fought, you know, I fought for those, those um, things that I thought were inequitable 
whether it be making the girls play in the small gym where when we took a basketball out we had to put our foot against the wall because that was out of bounds as opposed to the regular gym that had the full-size basketball court and the bleachers so people could come watch you know those types of things so and um, I continue to do that um, the national Tennis Association is called the U.S. Tennis Association, and they have leagues. And um, you know, I'm always taking a look at like, okay, is this is this right? It may not be um, gender related. Now that I'm getting older, um, they they have national championships for different ages. And last week I was um, in Florida playing in the national 65 team event. And it used to be part of the the national organization where um, there are 17 sections in the United States and Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and part of Idaho is a particular section. And we had a team going to play other sections in the nation. And they used to have a, a national tournament for the 65s. And then they just said, oh, well, we're not doing it. And we said, why? And they said, well, we changed it down to the 55 age. and. So we fought for that and we got a national tournament for the 65 age group, but now they call it a invitational, so they don't have to pay for it. But we went and played and we won our national title last week, so. But yeah, so I'm, you know, whether, whatever the inequities are, but I think that my fight for prior to Title IX, my, my fight, for all of women's athletics and opportunities in that regard um, has made me feel like I can be a spokesperson for other things like age or whatever it might be.